So our <coughs> next speaker. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity after me presenting about some of the group's work and some of the colleagues' work. Um, thank, thank them also for bringing us to this uh, beautiful venue. Thank you for some of the first world and stuff. We played a long time here. Um, so I'd like to start off by thanking uh, a large number of people. This has been a collaborative effort for a small group. We've done it lately and the interaction with the member of uh, excellent scientists. Um, so I'd like to first uh, acknowledge the work of Simon Manal. So you probably saw his work at the poster session yesterday. Uh, Murray Wilson, former uh, former student in, in, in Air Harvard. Uh, Nick uh, uh, Nullo and uh, Lori Evans are two undergraduate students who have been doing Micromagnetic simulations recently. We've benefited greatly from that uh, collaboration with Alex Bartonoff at the University of Michigan Franco. Uh, Mike Robinson has given us uh, excellent insight into structural raw materials with, with uh, TEM. Um, we, we have a really nice collaboration with the folks at Chalk River and NIST as we do scattering. Uh, most recently, we've been uh, collaborating with the two groups at Cambridge, uh, James Lovett and Tom Richards Group, and Fred Girelli and Andrew Curtis. So, in this talk, I'm going to, I would like to review um, the role of finite size and anisotropy in developing magnetic textures in, in, in paramagnetic materials. We've already heard a fair bit about this. Um, there are a number of things that can stabilize stirring underneath the two, uh, these two contributions that I'd like to focus on in my talk. Um, so, my talk's a little bit unusual maybe for this, for this conference because I'm going to show you where stirring ends are not. Uh, rather than where they are, um, this is a source of controversy. So a number of groups have been arguing about where sterionics exist in these materials. And so I'd like to summarize basically what the controversy is um, about the, the presence or absence of sterionics when you place the, the magnetic field in the electron direction. Uh, and then finally, I want to show you recent uh, measurements done in Cambridge on spin order support and conducting our measurements uh, that give rise to uh, modes that you don't see. In So here's a phase diagram that you, you've already seen, so I'd like to review this quickly. Uh, so Alex Bogdanoff in the seminal work uh, from 1989 realized that uh, exchange and Zalashinsky Maria are not enough to stabilize sterionics, so we have cubic materials, we need some other contribution. One other possible contribution for stabilizing them is deaxial anisotropy. So here's a phase diagram in the uh, field in an anisotropy phase space. And so, if you have an easy axis and isotropy, this easy axis will lower the energy of the core. The core is constant because it spins in the opposite direction of the field and there's no energy uh, in the core. Whereas, if you have a hard axis and isotropy, this turns out to suppress sterium. So, theoretically, at least at the beginning, we thought that you wouldn't find sterium at all in negative and isotropy. Although, as we learned yesterday, this, 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 is a, this is a little bit, the answer is a little bit more complex than that. But here, basically, the hard axis and isotropy increases the energy of the core, and that makes it less than a big big group of those three months before. Then, more recently, if we expand this, this phase diagram and look at zero and isotropy, and then ask what happens if we introduce finite size effects, here I'd like to show you the work of Philip Ritterkopf and Stefan Lugo, who showed that as if you look, stay at zero and isotropy and reduce the film thickness. What happens to the possible magnetic phases? So here you can see how things line up. And for zero and isotropy, you only expect a cone phase or, or a saturated state. There's also the stack spiral state. This is a surface state that I'll have time to talk, talk about, but it's interesting in its own right, uh, as well as some parallel water states that are also here. Again, I don't have time to go into that. But as you reduce the film thickness for all about 12 kilos of wavelengths, then what you find is that the hard side is able to stabilize sterionics. Sterionics are the tubes develop some twist. And as you lower the film thickness, the region of the field over which the sterionics are stable increases in 
the slides. And this is um, being observed experimentally for this control group. We're looking at MMS on wedges. And by going along the wedge, they see that the film increases or decreases in thickness, the size of the sturmion. Um, uh, the size of the sturmion base increases in the So MSI is uh, being built on, on something. It's an interesting uh, system to investigate some of these effects because we can, we can control film thickness, it's four times size. We have a last mismatch. So if there's a 3% last mismatch, so MSI is a 3%. Um, it's, it, uh, it is strained tensely, uh, tensile on, on the silicon substrate. Uh, here's a cross section TDM image that was done by Mike Robertson. You can see the nice. Uh, Sharp interface that's formed. Uh, one of the drawbacks of growing a parallel material on a central symmetric substrate is you get both left handed and right handed crystal, uh, crystal grains, which, uh, which we show in the, in the TV. And so these grain sizes can, can vary in size anywhere from like half a micron um, all the way up to you can see the large as a few micron as well. So what that means is if you have both left handed and right handed grains, that means that your magnetic structure is also going to have left hand helices and right hand helices. And we spent a, a great amount of time proving that the, in, the, in the zero field state, the propagation vector for the helix point by point. This is the disputed, but we have three of the ten measurements that, that, that we've done this. So we're quite, quite confident that this is, this is the case. But at the grain boundary, you can expect a lot of magnetic fluctuation. And so this complicates, uh, complicates the situation. And it is probably one of the reasons why there's disagreement between various things like this. Just what is, what is exactly going on at that But the nice thing about growing on large wafers is it makes MSI amenable to techniques that would not otherwise be possible. For instance, we can do polarized neutron spectrometry, and in polarized P and R, in inlay magnetic fields, we were the first to discover surface twists that exist in these films. Um, this was submitted actually a year prior to its publication. We fought for a year for the TRL. Um, and so we, we were deeply pressed by about a month by the group uh, in, in Paris. And so it's the Paris paper that often gets cited by ours, ours uh, unfortunately, gets missed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, wow, we don't. <laughs> <Yeah, we know. laughs> but, um, but I really want to focus on what's going on in, in, in our um, uh, so, what happens now? Uh, I want to basically talk a bit about, uh, touch on the talk that we heard uh, yesterday. What happens when we go to the to two dimensional? We, we learned last day that the sternion pocket, or sternion phase rather, extends over into a negative anisotropy region, the hard axis anisotropy region. And so, what I'd like to show is not a nice work we saw yesterday, but um, uh, different work because. Uh, the microwave and simulations on applying film thickness that is about half uh, half each uh, LD level. And there you can, I'm doing this like a compare directly with, with our experiments. So here you see the study on phase extending all the way up to about 0.25. Uh, uh, the nanosophy is 0.25 in these units. If we compare that to our measurement of GDX nanosophy for thinnest films of about 11 nanometers, we find H over H to the that places us go here on, on, the, on the phase diagram. So we're just outside that region where you theoretically expect to find sterions. However, if we reduce the thickness, of course, we're going to reduce the anisotropy. That's going to move us over to the right on the phase diagram. But this pocket is also going to shrink as we, as we increase the film thickness. So theoretically, it's not clear whether in this region, this immediate region, whether we should find sterniles or not. So I'd like to now move on and talk about what is the controversy surrounding whether sterniles exist or not in our permanent magnetic field. So one way you can look at this is with magnetometry, and what we see is that the, 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 the magnetic moment increases later we have some saturation field, and we calculate the piece of susceptibility. There's only five all the way up to saturation. So the group that Christian Fodder has shown that there's clear signatures of going in and out of the, the sternion phase, you see pieces of susceptibility that really um, marks the first order of magnetic phase transition between a cone phase and a sternion phase. You don't see any of that. So the only phase boundary that you can see is this one here, 
separating the cone phase from the saturated phase. So we were quite surprised when the group from uh, uh, the group from Ripon uh, found what they claim to be a tautological hall effect over a very large region of magnetic phase diagram. Their MSI films look very similar to ours. We didn't really see significant difference um, based on the measurements that they showed with other patients. So, of course, we did some topological hall effect measurements as well. So, we've already been introduced to the topological hall effect class uh, yesterday. And so, here's the standard model that everybody uses. I want to point out that this is the model that is used for parametrics. And so, it has a term from the Lorentz force, and it also has a, a, a contribution from from spin orbit scattering. So here's the anomalous Hall effect. And you can break this up into skew scattering and side jump scattering. And if you want to make it a little bit more, more sophisticated, you can do as, as others do, like the group at Rickon, and also separate out um, a defect scattering from an inelastic scattering, just so we can put all the possible ingredients and see if we can fit our data. So what's the, the standard way of fitting data is to measure the magnetization as a function of field and resistance as well. And then you plug these two measurements. In, in, in here on this formula, and then you've got D out the one out of zero in our non spinning parameters. Now it doesn't matter what you choose for those four fitting parameters, you can't fit the data. Here's this hump right here that uh, the Griffin claims is a topological hall effect, and red is the fit, and so there's a discrepancy between the, the model and the data. And so what everybody does in the field is say, well, if there's this discrepancy must be through some other term. That other term must be through the topological hall effect. I think that's a, a, a dangerous thing to do, and I'm going to argue that this isn't due to the topological hall effect. If you take the remainder, the residue from that fit, you can actually fit this very well with an additional elastic skew scattering contribution. And so if you add another term here, um, in other words, what you do is you put in a field dependent uh, skew scattering. The skew scattering in the cone phase we're claiming is different than the skew scattering in the paramagnetic phase. This model was developed for a paramagnet, and so nobody had really considered is the, is the scattering any different in different magnetic textures? In a priori, you don't expect the scattering to be the same. So if there's, if there's not any of that spin transport through or not any of that spin scattering in that cone phase, those, this outer parameter will be different in those different regions. Now, if you add a field dependent output, the output then you might ask, well, why hasn't this been seen involved? Actually, you can observe this involved. The reason why it was missed involved is because the crystals were very pure, and so the scattering was almost all entirely due to intrinsic scattering. Now, if you have defects, then the defects will have, it turned out, have an opposite sign, and so they reduce the size of this uh, anomalous Hall effect to the point where you can begin to see large deviations between the cone phase and and so here is the work of Lee from the Long School of Princeton. And if you look very carefully at the fit, there is a deviation in cone phase. If you take the difference between the model and the data, you get this hump that has the exact same amplitude moving along the poles. So I'd argue, yes, this is also exists in bulk as well as in bulk. But after this work, um, Starting out, the, the, the group from, from the UK um, decided to, to see if they could gain some uh, additional insight by looking at muons uh, spin rotation. And so this is the work of the, uh, by the group of Durham as well as Oxford. And in USR, which we measure the distribution of magnetic fields inside your sample. And so this is the measurement of that distribution of fields. Here is the simulation of what that distribution should look like for cone phase and for helix. And what we see is this is much broader than in the cone phase than the, the calculated distribution. So they argue that there, there must be something more complex than, than just a simple cone. Here's the simulation for skirmions, and so this looks quite different than skirmions. They haven't ruled out the possibility of skirmions, but it's, it's a little bit unclear exactly what the source of that broadening is from. I argue that perhaps this one is broadening might be coming from the grain boundaries. The magnetic frustration that exists between the power of the boundaries is leading to a, a broader distribution of magnetic fields inside the cell. So that summarizes the controversy. And so I want to give some additional measurements um, to answer the question are there any experiments in magnetic fields? 
And so I want to show you recent measurements of this spin orbit for the FMI. So we've already heard a very nice talk. Um, uh, the previous talk that has already sort of introduced you to some of the excitations uh, in, uh, in chiral magnets and in MSI. So I just want to remind you here of the dispersion curve. Um, so as you go from a cone phase to a paramagnetic phase, the effective field of the Velshinsky Maria interaction decreases. So you've got softening basically of that, of that resonant frequency. Up in so this critical field right here, then above this, you're in a paramagnetic phase. Now it looks like a regular cone. Now, if you're doing FMR, um, uh, people who do FMR on, on, uh, on full magnetic films typically only see excitations at k is equal to zero. So sometimes they're surprised when, when they're told that this is an excitation at k is equal to q, with the q back of the helix. And the way to understand that is, is realizing that the spins in, in, in an FMR experiment are processing both the local, uh, the, uh, local effective magnetic field. And in the helix, that type of magnetic field is rotating as you move along, move along the helix. So if you transform this to the rotating frame of reference, things become a little bit more clear. In that rotating reference frame, you now have a paramagnet. But now your drive field is now a field with the pitch of the helix. So that helical drive field, of course, is going to set up an excitation in this helical momentum field. So here's the dispersion relation. Um, and so, in, in an upper mark, it's going to be probably this part of the dispersion relation at k is equal to q. And then, as you increase the magnetic field, you get a softening. And uh, the softening of that, of that resonant frequency. So, the Cambridge group has got this really, really interesting technique for uh, measuring paramagnetic resonance in these materials. They don't use an external magnetic field to do the excitation, they use spin over torque. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with spin orbit torque, uh, what happens in these experiments is you take a, a bar that's patterned that's 49 microns long, uh, 200 nanometers wide, or, or 4 microns wide, you send in a microwave current. Now in the, in the rest rate of, of the electrons, the crystal field gets Lorentz transformed into a magnetic field. And, and the, uh, the symmetry of that um, spin orbit field depends on the symmetry of the crystal. And for a D20 structure, that field is radial in case space. It has a lot of symmetry. And so as you're oscillating the current, you've got this oscillating spin orbit field that causes the precession of the spins inside the material. Now, as the spins are precessing, the, the angle is deviating with respect to the direction of the current. And so you get an oscillating resistance by the NS product and either the resistance effect. Now, if you take the product between the current and the resistance, you see that you actually get rectification. Get a DC component um, uh, to, to your response. So you can measure the microwave absorption simply by measuring the, the voltage across the bar and send the magnetic field current. So here's the, the measured voltage as a function of the frequency of the field, and here you can see the softening of the resonant frequency of the cone phase as you approach saturation. And once you hit saturation, you can see a hint of the tail length of the resonance right here. But the thing to note is, is that there's no discontinuity in that cone phase. So I just want to have some backup and remind you of uh, Seki Sounds from Tall T. He was the person to basically see the, the resonant excitations in the Spurgeon phase. And there you see different clockwise or even an anti-clockwise noise. But we don't see any of these in the, uh, in, in the spin over torque of the measurements. So there's no evidence. For spermions and other plane magnetic fields, consistent with our other measurements. If you increase the temperature from 10K to 25K, this move, this mode here moves to um, moves to lower field frequency as the, uh, the field HD becomes uh, smaller. So this looks very similar to bulk at first glance. However, there's a new mode here that you don't see in bulk. And then if you look carefully here at the zero field frequency, find that it's much lower than what you'd expect. For films, if you calculate what, what that intercept should be, it should be about 36 gigahertz, where here it looks something closer to 25. So what's going on here? Well, if we go to a different sample, it's the same film, but patterned down with a, with a, a two micron, a 200 nanometer wide bar. Now you can see the emergence of another mode that wasn't so clear in the previous data. 
And so we have to get two modes compared to just one you can see them all. Here's the dispersion relation. And so the reason why these modes are different is because you also have to take into account the boundary conditions in the film. And so these three boundaries basically lead to anti-nodes in the excitation at the top and bottom. And so you get a standing wave solution. And here's a cartoon of what that standing wave would look like. We've got anti-nodes here at the top and bottom, and then the, 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 the lowest energy excitation will happen in the middle. So that would, this standing wave uh, basically consists not of a k is equal to q, but k is equal to n pi uh, d. And so you have both plus and minus n pi d, for instance, superimposed to give the standing wave, um, uh, this standing wave structure, or 2 pi d, we have a second standing wave structure. So these are the two modes that you see right here. So here you see what looks like um, the n is equal to 2 uh, ferromagnetic resonance mode, but it looks to be absent if the n is equal to 1 mode. And if you look carefully here, this, this mode has shifted over here to, to uh, higher fields. So this puzzled us for a while. Here's the micromagnetic simulations where we have no surface anisotropy, and the micromagnetic calculations are really able to reproduce nicely the n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 1 in the cold phase. You can see this n is equal to 2 mode in the ferromagnetic phase. But here, this n is equal to 1 mode here is, is, um, is present in the micromagnetic calculations, but not in the data. So Nick added a surface anisotropy to both top and bottom, and that surface anisotropy just shifted the saturation field basically just shift those modes up to higher field. So that didn't fit the data well. But then he decided to add uh, an anisotropy just to the bottom surface. And you expect a difference between the top and bottom surface, because at the bottom, you've got single crystal silicon. At the top, we have more amorphous silicon. More the silicon. At the bottom, we've got heavily strained, and at the top, some of that strain is going to relax. So there's good reason to expect a difference in the surface anisotropy between the top. And when you have that surface anisotropy, what that does is, is that the spins close to that silicon substrate end um, don't saturate at a different field value than the ones that are over there at the, at the other surface. So if you arrive at this field here just above the saturation field, nearly or about half the, the film is in a saturated state, but here we still have a twisted state as the, as the spins are fighting against that surface anisotropy. Then you overcome this. this um, the surface anisotropy at a field below 1.5 Tesla. Now you've got an onset of, of, um, of a ferromagnetic mode, a ferromagnetic surface mode. And this uh, ferromagnetic surface mode is kind of interesting. It comes about from a superposition of two k vectors that are centered not about zero, but are centered about uh, k is equal to q. So in this case, you've got a standing, a standing wave, just like in the previous case, except this is a helical standing wave. And there's a phase shift between the spins as we move through that, as we move through that standing wave. So that basically summarizes the um, talk that we, we might have covered, uh, standing field and magnons in, inside, in, inside this material. These are modes that aren't of the very involved. Um, and these standing field and magnon modes help confirm the absence of stern lines in that magnetic fields. At least for the film thicknesses that we've explored, which is around, sort of around 20 to 25 uh, nanometer film thickness. So, the thing that I want to leave you with is these two phase diagrams right here. I want to summarize by saying that we've done polarized neutron photometry, small angle neutron scattering, ferromagnetic resonance, magnetometry, and all of the results um, consistently um, uh, represent these two physical features of the phase diagram. No stereons and other magnetic fields, but as you heard, um, hopefully with my talk in Simon yesterday, that for in plane uh, fields, we have these stereon tubes that lie in the plane, and there's a, there's a pocket um, within the face diagram where you do see stereons. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yes, that's right. Yeah, you know, I, I don't I don't have that analysis here with me. Uh, that, that's something that Kiara has looked into. Um, and there, there's still one contribution that, that's still not clear, but she does see she did see all the wild seeds that she discussed last time. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I have a question concerning the synthesis on assumption. How big were the fruits that you looked at? So with the FMR measurements, they were 19 nanometers compared to 14 nanometer plus. So this means it must be very strongly thickness dependent on that. To make it thicker, the relative importance of the air and the relative of the air is going to be less. Did you check what happens to get this thicker film? No, we haven't done that yet. But, but the films are thick enough now that you can, that you can separate what's going on in the interface from what's going on in the ball. Right, so we're thick enough, so we, we, we've already done that. So what I expect is you agree film thickness. That mold will still be there. It will just become smaller in density as you. Uh, just to make sure that I'm still your results. What happens? Phase diagram in my film is give up of the physics. Phase diagram is functioning that over the bridge. Yeah, the bridge. Yes, this one, for instance. So your film thickness is just larger than the thickness, so you would be at what, one point something times LD, is that correct? That's right. So from that perspective, you should have seen a spermium. But when we have anisotropy, this is zero anisotropy. This is zero anisotropy. Right. And, and so this is, you know, if I back up, we're, we're just behind this plane right here, right? So we're sort of in a region of the, the theoretical phase diagram that isn't filled out yet. So but, theoretically, it, it's still unclear. But it's very close, actually, to where you'd expect them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
changes of the circles due to the change of symmetry, but if you do not include the corresponding effect as changing the DMI in the way you change the number of the velocity, the characteristic is not very significant, and uh, if the characteristic is not very significant, it's going to be high positive. Do you have any hint from your person or from your experiments, say, an error bar or something? I think this is an important thing in the case. And you know, already we have a lot of heavy 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 parameters. And so what we really need is some independent measurements uh, in a way of extracting surface DMI from all the things. I think I think this is an important issue. We don't have any experiments like any other on that at this point. Okay. Is this the one that uh So this is